Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Waddell. I am the holder of the Edna and George McMahon Aquinas Chair in Philosophy here at St. Mary's College, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's McMahon Aquinas Lecture. The lecture is an annual event sponsored by the Edna and George McMahon Aquinas Chair in Philosophy. The chair was established in 1999 by a gift from Joyce McMahon Hank in honor of her parents, Edna and George McMahon. Edna was a courageous educator in the Chicago Public Schools, and George was an innovative scientist who was awarded numerous patents throughout his career. Joyce McMahon Hank was graduated from St. Mary's College with degrees in philosophy and art. She received an honorary doctorate of humanities from the college in 1995 and is an emerita member of the Board of Trustees. The McMahon Aquinas Chair was established to ensure that new generations of St. Mary's students would be introduced to the teachings of the angelic doctor and to sustain the spirit of St. Thomas's work, a spirit embodied in a living intellectual tradition that values sincere questions and seeks truth wherever it is to be found. As current holder of the McMahon Aquinas Chair, it's my great privilege to introduce tonight's guest speaker, His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson. Cardinal Turkson was born in Western Ghana, the fourth of 10 children in his family. He was educated in Ghana, the United States, and Rome. He was ordained a priest in 1975 and appointed Archbishop of Cape Coast by Pope St. John Paul II in 1992. In 2003, he became the first Ghanaian cardinal when Pope St. John Paul II created him cardinal priest of San Laborio. Now, for those who are not familiar with St. Laborius, he was a fourth century bishop of Le Mans, France, which is, of course, the birthplace of the family of Holy Cross. During his years in the Roman Curia, Cardinal Turkson has been a member of the Congregation for Catholic Education, the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, the Pontifical Commission for the Cultural Heritage of the Church, the Pontifical Committee for International Eucharistic Congresses, and the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. He served as president of the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace and was chosen by Pope Francis to become the first prefect of the dicastery for promoting integral human development when the Council for Justice and Peace was subsumed into that new dicastery. As a result of his work on social issues, including the environment, sustainability, the economy, migrants, refugees, and integral human development, Cardinal Turkson has come to be recognized around the world as a leader in social justice. And so it is a privilege for us to have him here tonight to speak about the poor, the vulnerable, and the common good. Please join me in welcoming His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Turkson. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael, for your kind words of introduction. So, uh, dear Dr. John Cervelli, President of St. Mary's College, Dr. Nancy Negvasil, Provost of St. Mary's College, the leadership team of the Sisters of the Holy Cross, the distinguished members of the Board of Trustees of St. Mary's College, dear friends of St. Mary's College and all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, I bring all of you the greetings of the Dicastery for the Promotion of Integral Human Development. And on its behalf, I wish this event, the McMahon Aquinas Lectures 2018, so great success. 
I want to thank the Board of Trustees, the President and the staff, heartily for inviting me to deliver the McMahon Aquinas Lecture for this year. And so, my dear friends, we all had supper together, and I hope this doesn't cause anybody indigestion. <laughs> and uh, I brought some tums with me in case anybody would need anything like that. So at the, at the, at the very beginning, my dear friends, of the church's social teaching, Pobleo the 13th had this observation to make. He said, nothing is more useful than to look upon the world as it really is. And at the same time, to seek elsewhere for the solace to its troubles. So this was in Rerum Novarum, paragraph 18. So to look upon the world as really is, but when it comes to solving its problems, you need to look elsewhere. This is almost like what Archimedes said very many years ago, give me a place outside the world and a lever and I'll move the world. So sometimes we just need to step out of the situation to be able to look at it and find solutions to some of its problems. And so also dealing with some of the problems we have, we also probably need to step out to find some resource material to be able to deal with some of the problems. And so tonight, discussing the topic, the poor, the vulnerable, and the common good, where can we look for solace to the challenge that the persistent presence of poverty and vulnerable people in our midst pose to our sense of a common good? Adopting tonight, then, a very simple method made famous by a Belgian cardinal, Cardinal Joseph Cardin, a method called the Ceylon Method, C, Judge and Act. I'd like to then approach this topic. We moved quite a bit. Initially with the invitation, we were trying to prepare something on Aquinas and justice. And then we learned that the preference would be for poor, vulnerable, and the common good. So we left Aquinas and justice, and we descended in the pit. <laughs> but so we like to refer to the insights of this Belgian cardinal with which he worked with the workers' movement in Belgium and France very many years ago, and a method which he brought to the Second Vatican Council and which did inspire the creation of the document on the laity and the document of the church in society or the church in the modern world, Cardium Espes. It is a famous and very popular topic or method of see, judge, and act. So tonight, together with you, I'd like to try to take a look at the phenomenon, the presence in our midst of, of the poor and the vulnerable, and they are challenging to the common good. And by way of judging, I'd like to refer to the church's teaching about the human person. Since the issue of poverty and vulnerability become a very basic issue about the human person, any sense and experience of dignity. We'll then refer a little bit to the church's teaching about a little bit Christian anthropology, relational anthropology, to see what help we can derive from all of that towards this, and then see how this understanding, how this evaluation of the 
issue of these challenges of society have led into the formation of a method of study which is the integral development of the human person and then see how Pope Francis in merging dicasteries and making this the program of action of the dicastery is actually setting up an office in the Vatican to ensure the realization of precisely the issue, to deal with the issue of just uh, uh, poor and vulnerable, and so realize essential the experience of integral human development in our world. So that's what we want to do. Let us then look at instances and presentations of poor and the vulnerable in our midst. Attempting to, to give any definition of this will take us probably all evening. So I just, I just present instances where people, situations that people refer to as poor, vulnerable, and see what is within those statements or what lies behind those statements and identify what, is li what lies behind those statements, which I then go to see what sense we can make out of those and see the method to approve. So we, look, we want to look at instances and presentations of the poor and the vulnerable in our midst. This will be the moment of seeing for us. Then we shall seek to understand the human value of the existence and the experiences made by the poor and the vulnerable in our midst in the light of the biblical Christian tradition. And that will be the moment of judging the situation of the poor and vulnerable in our midst. Finally, we shall consider what concrete action may be formulated and applied as responses and remedies to the existence of poor and vulnerable ones in our midst, and that will be ACT. So the see, judge, and act would be presented tonight in this way. So sampling instances and presentations of the poor and the vulnerable in our world we shall look at the tradition of the church, the moral analysis of the situation, and in the light of the gospel teaching, try to evaluate the worth of such experiences and to what extent we can refer to them as truly human experiences. And if we cannot refer to them as truly human experiences, in what perspective then can we consider them? And from the principles which emerge from so considering their worth as truly human experiences, we'll see how this principle then go to formulate or guide the church in the development of the very many principles underlying the issue of uh, integral human development. So let's begin. First, seeing. The poor and the vulnerable in our midst, who are they? Where are they? How do we find them? Where can we find them? And so on and on and on. And I'd like to begin with Pope Francis. At the inaugural mass, after he'd been chosen and made Pope, in fact, actually in the conclave, when the votes, counting of votes, started you know, going his direction, another friend, Cardinal, sitting by him, Cardinal Humes from Brazil, touched him and said, you know, coraggio, so take courage. But please do not forget the poor. And that appears to have been the experience which guided Francis in the choice of name Francis as a name that he wanted to be called as a pope. So when Pope Francis then was celebrating his first mass in St. Peter's on the 19th of March, Feast of St. Joseph, reflecting on the role of Joseph as the guardian of the Holy Family, Pope Francis then invited all of us to become guardians. Guardians of the church, yes, but guardians of two fragilities in our midst. And those fragilities were creation or nature abused and then the poor ones in our midst. Then he went on to say, these two fragilities are crying to humanity to be heard. So that was Pope Francis 
at the beginning of his pontificate. His first mass, Feast of St. Joseph, the guardian of the Holy Family, the Pope uses that to invite all of us to become guardians of two fragile elements in our midst, the poor and creation which is being exploited, abused in so very many other ways. Right after that, coming from Argentina, then the Pope invited our office, which at that time was the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, to organize a meeting in Rome, a meeting for the popular movement groups. This is a, 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 you know, a, a group very common in Latin America. This is a group made up of the campesinas, the cartoneros, indigenous populations, and so people living in favelas, so the ghettos and all of that. So Pope Francis then invited us to organize a meeting for these people, and he wanted the meeting organized in the Vatican. And his words were that he wanted to plant a flag in the Vatican. So consent for the people who make up the popular movement, the cartoneros, the campesinos, the favelas, and the indigenous people, were to, were to, to take place in the Vatican. So we did. And not only once, but twice and thrice, three times did we organize meeting with these uh, groups, which you know, consider popular movements. And the concern of the group was about three things. Tierra, land, techos, roof over the head, a housing, and trabajo, work. That's all they were looking for, tierra, techo, and trabajo. This is what the members of the group for the popular movement type of thing came looking for. Three things were foremost and of their greatest need. Land to work on, roof over their head, and then work. What they maintain and keep their families with. So we organized that three times. The third one was then actually here in the United States, in Modesto, in the Central Valley of Modesto, you know where that place, what is, it's a big farming area with a lot of also, you know, a lot of uh, farm hands, you know, also from there. That was uh, where we did the third one, happily supported by five bishops of the area, Stockton, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. So these bishops came to support the organization of this event. Again, we were not in Latin America, but the issues were the same land, roof over the head, and a decent work to do and to carry out. So, Pope Francis's invitation to be guardians drew attention to the poor in our midst and the environment or the earth which was being abused or exploited. Then, the invitation to organize these meetings for the popular movements drew attention to the homelessness of situations the poor in our midst and in our cities, so they need for land to work, roof over the head, and work to do. This was a serious situation in Latin American countries, as you know. The, get, the ghettos then have become what they call this, uh, the, villa, the Villa Miserias, uh, the city of misery, or, or the favelas. So people moving into towns and not finding a way to celebrate, you find them all over. My last visit to Medellin in Colombia, just two weeks ago, saw the same thing. Side by side with skyscrapers, where hillsides sprawling with such developments. Poverty has that kind of uh, a face. So inequality appears to be that thing. Lack of consideration in the mainstream of affairs. A certain amount of invisibility because of the state of life they you know, live in, these appear to characterize uh, some such situations. Here in the United States, you know about the CRS and the Catholic charities and what they do, the soup kitchens that they provide and all. It's also for a certain amount, a certain type of population here in our midst, okay, with certain needs. That also characterizes some who need to be fed and sometimes we need to be clothed. Then, here in the United States again, a short while ago, there was a big problem over here in Jefferson. And as you know, there's a report that came out of uh, that, uh, of uh, all the conflict and everything that uh, 
I think over there. So it's a Jefferson report, a, a report prepared which you can read. It's accessible, available online, which you can read. And it tries to underline some of the problems underlying the tensions that erupted into those violence. Part of them was inequality in real estate development, inequality in access to capital and works that people have to do. And these were also identified in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in this report. Then, the United Nations Council for Trade and Development is also done a serious study about the, this, uh, the presence in our midst of such people. And he said the general secretary of that, a gentleman from Kenya himself, but whose office is in Geneva, he says that global poverty is increasingly concentrated among a group of 40, 48 countries which are falling further behind the rest of the world in terms of economic development according to a UN, United Nations report. And he goes on to say, the proportion of the global poor in the 48 least developed countries has more than doubled since 1990 to well over 40%. Their share of those with, without access to water has doubled to 43.5% in the same period. And these countries now account for, that, for the majority, 53.5%, of the 1.1 billion people worldwide who do not have access to electricity, to water, and to the basic necessities of life. After this report of the United Nations Council for Trade and Development, UNCTAD, at Davos, where I have had the honor of representing or taking the message of Pope Francis twice, you may have heard about declarations that Oxfam is consistently made at Davos from the year 2013 to date. Oxfam has consistently drawn attention to the fact that 82% of the wealth generated in the world go to the richest 1% of the global population, where 3.7 billion people who make up the poorest half of the world see no increase in their wealth. According to a new Oxfam report that released at Davos, the report is being launched as political and as political and business people gather to consider development in the world. So, alongside and following the report of Oxfam, which basically underlies fair poverty as an experience of inequalities, Pope Francis in his message also refers to that experience. Pope Francis says, do not forget the poor. And he issued this present appeal to the leading representatives of the world's political, financial, and cultural leaders meeting in Davos. He invites them to discuss the theme, mastering the fourth industrial revolution. We must never allow the culture of prosperity to deaden us and to make us incapable of feeling compassion for the outcry of the poor, weeping of other people's pain, and sensing the need to help them as though all this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. And so he exhorted the worker, the, uh, the business people who had gathered in Davos, he urged them to build an inclusive society and an inclusive political system, just and supportive of societies and all sectors of society. And so ended up by writing, we cannot remain silent in the face of the suffering of millions of people whose dignity is wounded, nor can we continue to move forward if the spread of poverty and justice has no Cure. So this is what this was Davos. And subsequently, the International Labour Organization is also weighed in on this issue of poverty and vulnerabilities in the world. 
It's weighed in Seto, drawing attention to the conflict and the fragility affected states. Drawing attention to the fact that related with the migration issue is the phenomenon of conflict and fragility ridden states. More than 5,000 refugees which, who perished in the Mediterranean in 2017 were from some such certain. A certain combined, whose uh, combined characterization is conflict, but at the same time suffering from the effect of climate change, the drought in the Horn of Africa, which drives Eritreans and Somalis to flee. So millions of vulnerable people are trapped in complex network of human trafficking and forced labor. Vulnerable communities in every nation struggle to find sufficient food, sufficient housing, water, and medical care. These are our brothers and sisters. And the question is whether we see them, whether they have any visibility uh, to be noticed and to be seen. Then, related with this, is the issue of local governance and how they also contribute to the poverty and the vulnerability of local populations. This is probably strange to mention, but it is true. Local governments and their contribution to poverty and the vulnerability of situations. A friend of mine, member of a, a group called the Brent Hurst Foundation, that does studies on political developments and economic developments in Africa, called Greg Mills, he wrote a book called Why Africa is Poor. And he answers in that book that Africa is poor by choice. And the choice is a choice made by its leaders. So this is a case where governance, poor governance, contributes to the experience of poverty and vulnerability in different countries and different lands. Africa has its share. Southeast Asia does have some such things also. So the, our attempt to discover and to get to the bottom of the experience of poverty in the world is not a simple situation. It's not simply because there's conflict and war in a, an area or climate change. The, the causes of poverty and vulnerability differ from place to place. The one thing that is common is that the human persons affected, the poor and the vulnerable, are the ones who, have, who experience a challenge in their own experience of their dignity in their own personal worth and in their own personal respect and dignities. There is another cry which needs to be recognized and heard, and this is from the earth. It is so very common in the Western world to read the book of Genesis, and then people say that in Genesis, God said, told Adam, the human person, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. And this in several situations are led and or justified even the abuse or exploitative treatment of the resources of the earth. Saying that they are fulfilling the mandate uh, of scriptures, the mandate given by God to subdue the earth and to have dominion over it. Now subdue the earth and have dominion over it. Here this evening, I don't think you want me to do any Hebrew philological analysis with you. Uh, but, but the words, again, subdue and have dominion, simply do not express what a lot of people would wish to see it expressed. That is something in our power, and we do to it what we want. That is not the sense of the subdue and to, uh, to have dominion over the riches of the earth. Especially since the word used for having dominion over the thing, again, I'm trying to not to go Hebrew, huh? but if it is university, so you may also know. The, 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 the word used to, you know, to, to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to work the land is avad. And avad to work is the same word that means to serve. But it's also the same word that is used for the rendering of cult to God in his temple. As if we say somebody, you know, we're going, to, we're going for service. And going for service is sometimes going to the church to pray. So the root avad 
It's not simply an expression of servile treatment, but it's also an expression of a, a cultic relationship with God. So the same word with which you use to dominate the earth is also supposed to be the way that you render cult and service to God. Therefore, the sense of it cannot be a downright exploitative, abusive treatment of the earth for its resources and anything. But sometimes it's the situation also uh, for the earth. Another expression, again from the book of Genesis, when God entrusted the land to, to Adam, he says, he, he, he again says in the second account, so this is uh, uh, the book of, the book of uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. God again said it, you know, um, told Adam uh, when he brought him to the garden is to keep and to till the land, to keep and to till the land. And again, the sense is being again about the relationship with the earth. Again, keep and to tell. Keep and tell the land. Recognize that when Cain killed his brother Abel, and God asked him where your brother is, the answer of Cain is the same verb. Am I my brother's keeper? So keeping the land is almost the same as the type of relationship that a brother has towards a brother. A kinship relationship, as it were. The Bible was certainly written thousands of years before St. Francis of Assisi. But St. Francis' expression of a kinship relationship between himself and the elements of creation already dates from there. To keep, to keep the earth, the small, is also the same way that you treat a brother. The relationship of responsibility towards a brother is expressed in the same term. And so Francis Layton will come and say, Brother Sun and Sister Moon and all of those, expressing, expressing the relationship to creation in such you know, kinship terms is also something that is worth noting. And this simply goes to underline the fact that the, 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 the observation that the Pope makes that the earth is crying to us on account of abusive treatment is something then, then that does not quite gel with the data that we have from Scripture. And so we can go on and on describing some, 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 some more of these things. So just last week, 1st of September, as you know, in, in support of the Eastern Orthodox rite of celebrating the 1st of September as a day of prayer for creation, Pope Francis has invited the Catholic Church to also celebrate the 1st of September as a day of prayer for creation. And so in several places on the 1st of September, they do prayer, they do vigil, they pray for creation, they pray for the earth. In support, again, in relation with what the Orthodox Church does. And the message that the Pope issued on that day, again, calls for the same thing. He invites us to listen with the heart, not only with the mind, but with the heart to the cry of the poor and the cry of the needy, so the earth in our midst. To listen with the heart. Help more sympathetic and with a certain amount of passion and care. So can we go on and on and on, present this to But all I like to say with all of these instances is this. The poverty and vulnerability sometimes are represented in economic terms and in terms of inequality in development. Sometimes they are presented in the terms of neglect or abusive treatment of others. Sometimes that is the case when a mining community goes to an area to do mines, destroying water bodies and everything. That kind of thing also creates a represent. And when you know, people from the village migrate into the city, where, where they settle, you know, gets no visibility from the administrators of the city and all of that. So all of this contribute to the phenomenon that we want to study tonight as, you know, poor, as the poor and the vulnerable ones in our midst. And we can go on still presenting some more issues. What we, I, want, I want to do from this, uh, from, from this point on is, from all of this, from this survey, what we see generally the, uh, to be the situation is that it is the nature of the poor, the vulnerable, which are not quite recognized. So it is, if you want, their humanity that, that misses out of the equation, that, is, that, 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 that does not get visibility and consideration. So it is in the light of that, that uh, we want to you know, consider that. Uh, Pope, Pope, Pope Francis, I call for inclusive development. Inclusive development that, you know, that, that has the poor in, uh, the poor in mind. 
We, on our own side in the Vatican, our office is that stuff about the inclusive banking, inclusive economy, something that brings everybody on board. So when this is the case, then we thought that we might derive, as Pope uh, Leo said at the beginning, where do we get a solace? Where do we get a solution for this? We thought we might look at the, our, our understanding of the human person, so a sense of Christian anthropology, to see whether we can now find some solution uh, to, the, to, to the consideration of the poor and the vulnerable ones in our midst. And so it's, uh, we want to know that development in this, uh, when it is not, uh, when it is not equal, when it is not inclusive, misses us something. And as has been observed, ironically, development itself has not been well developed as a concept and a term much in its own history, despite all the applications that is made of it. For too long, the conventional idea of development has just been economic growth. When people grow economically, so GDP rises and all of that, then it seems to be, you know, development is taking place. The other factors and experiences can all uh, be suffer and neglect, but the GDP becomes a term. We just want to step a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit beyond that and, 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 and observe that when the church speaks of development, it always starts from the premise of human dignity, which flows from the fact that every human being is made in the image and the likeness of God. And so if creation of, a, of the human person, the image and likeness of God, establishes his dignity, the dignity of every person, then the subsequent creation of a brotherhood, Cain and Abel, Cain and Seth, makes a brotherhood of fraternity the basis of all of the human family and the vocation of all its members. Brotherhood, that's a very particular expression that is used, again, in Greek, they call it Adelphos. And Adelphos means that from the same womb. And the reference to brothers and sisters as coming from the same womb is very significant. Because coming from the same womb, they necessarily share the same dignity. It's not possible or conceivable that brothers and sisters coming from the same womb has, have, you know, have different dignities. One has more dignity than the other. So brotherhood, it's not simply the, you know, the life of communion that you know, members of a, of, of a family uh, share and enjoy, but the fact that they come from the same womb means that they share the same nature. They're equal in dignity. One brother doesn't have more dignity than the other brother. So the equality, they said the equal sense of dignity is very crucial. And that means that it's crucial also for the rich and the poor. Uh, there's no human being who has more dignity than at the other. Since dignity is that from with which we're born. We may be born poor, we may be born sick, but we're born always with the dignity. That is the image and the likeness of God. In this sense, the sense of development as a realization of human dignity must apply to all. True development must therefore be universal. Developing what every person possesses by nature Having such a universal scope, development is not real and it falls short of its scope when it applies only to some persons and not to other persons. Therefore, there is no I who can live in full human dignity so long as there is another I who cannot live in full human dignity. It's not possible to have such a condition. The very existence of others who cannot live in dignity or not because they're living in hardship or for oppression or whatever tells us that social conditions are flawed and that development is not integral and that there's something wrong. So, my dear friends, development then must be seen as an affirmation of the great dignity and intrinsic worth of every person everywhere in every generation. For authentic human development must be the lot of every person and all persons. And this 
is the basis of the principle of the common good. The common good refers to this. Being all the same and has having the same nature and identity, everything then uh, become, be, belongs to all of us. Time allowing, and as you probably know, Aquinas has a very interesting reflection on the common good and the way it is related with the dignity of the human person. It will be noted in the footnote if later on this, you know, you get a copy of the text. The Second Vatican Council then held out this image of one human family as revealing our common sense of belonging to God and seeking God, having been created in his image and, image and likeness, who from one person has created the whole human family, and therefore establishing all of us with the same dignity and identity as his children. Furthermore, the human person endowed with dignity by reason of his creation in the image and likeness of God and subsequently called to brotherhood or sisterhood in his coexistence with others of his type and kind is given dominion over all created things, everything in the garden placed under his care. This also leads us to affirm another principle about the human family. The fact that the human person introduced into the garden in the second account or the first account and trust put in charge of everything created means that the good things of the earth were destined to all. This is what we call the universal destination of the goods of the earth. Everything that is created is destined for all of humanity. All of humanity is meant to benefit, to sustain its life from the goods of the earth, from the endowments of creation. The account of the beginning of the human race also establishes three levels of relationships for the human person. In his dignity, the human person is set in relationship with God, the creator, in relationship with further human being, a brother and a sister, and with the earth on which it lives or which it has as a home. So a relational being is what all human persons are. We are all relational beings, beings in relation, created to be in relationship with one another, first with God, with one another, and with the earth, which is our home. Now, as such relational beings with God, with our neighbor, and with one another, the thing that comes up is the sense of this relationship. We come in a little bit to St. Thomas Aquinas again. Aquinas tries to name this relationship, and the name he gives for it is use, uh, justice. And so Aquinas identified the relationship that is between the human person and God and with the one another and then it as justice. And so justice is what? We were created to exist in. We exist in justice in our relationship with God, with one another, and with the earth. We created to exist in justice. And the sense of justice is when we respect the demands of the relationship in which we live. Then we just. Every just person respects the demands of the relationship in which he or she lives. When one disrespects, neglects, abuses the demands of the relationship in which he or she lives, the Old Testament calls such a person unjust or the wicked. But that is the beginning of the problem. St. Thomas then understands justice in terms of respect for the use, what is due to another person. And it will lead later Thomistic scholars and thinkers to describe relational justice as pertinent to human existence. So Aquinas goes on further by saying that justice is a moral virtue. And as a moral virtue, it is that by which we exercise constant and perpetual care of our will, exercising and desiring what is good. So a virtue, according to Aquinas, is a good habit of the mind by which we live righteously. And so according to, accordingly, a moral virtue or a habit disposes our appetites, including our rational appetite, the will, 
to act in accordance with reason and towards what is good. Since justice is in the highest, uh, highest form of our appetite, the will, as a virtue, it is about rectifying all our rational appetite so that we desire what is good, good for ourselves, good for our neighbor, and good for all we live with. And so in this sense, according to Aquinas, justice is the first, and in a sense, the greatest of moral virtues, for it directs the acts of all virtues towards the common good. So this is St. Thomas, and what you know, he has to say about this. We can go on more with Thomas Aquinas, but we'll skip some more and then, and then still go on to conclude this term. So, returning to the account of the origins of the earth, or in the book of Genesis, it is the sense of justice that underlies all the account of the experiences of sin and fall in the book of Genesis as failed relations. The first sin which Christian literature calls the fall of Adam, was an act of injustice, if you want disobedience to God. The human person, therefore, shares in a fallen nature, although this fallen nature will be restored and redeemed by Christ later. Christ, the last Adam, according to Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, has, has saved us and then has you know, restored us in grace. But the thing that is important to note, in terms of what we shall later on be uh, uh, talking about in development, is to recognize that the nature of the human person is a fallen nature called to grace. This will make Pope Benedict and the other posts let's say later on that development, therefore, is something that is given to man. It's not something that comes from man. It is something that can be done only with the help of God and with the openness to God. Because the nature of the human person is not completely destroyed, but it's wounded. Because of the fall and the call to grace, what, one, the, what the human person needs to do to fully realize its own nature and dignity of others requires the support and the assistance of grace. And so this, again, for us is a significant. Significant because... We do a lot of work with the United Nations, and we're now working with them about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. And when the SDGs were presented in 2015, in September, by the former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he referred to the SDGs as human dignity narrative that leaves nobody behind. The SDGs are human dignity narrative that leaves nobody behind. And so the human dignity SDGs are meant to promote, as it were, the development, the growth of everybody, leaving nobody behind. But when you get to the details, then it becomes something again, a little more you know, economic again, about development in terms of economic terms, the GDPs and all of those. And when that is the case, we think that as a chair, we have something to contribute to the talk about development. We come with all the, all, everything that we said about human dignity, but the most importantly, the nature of the human person. The human person in Christian terms is a fallen nature. It's not down and out, but they say yes, there's a weakness in the human nature which is culminated, which is satisfied, or which is made up only by the grace of God. So it means for us that when we start talking about development and what we do to another person for another person in the name of development, we recognize that it's not just us, our mind, our technology, and what we think. But we need to make room for the openness huh, to this spiritual or the grace that I mentioned, to be able to overcome the blind spots of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of reason and the sciences. So additionally then, the human person with inalienable dignity exists in relationship with others. And relationship like a coexistence begins in the family and the immediate community and expands to the nation and international levels. Therefore, relationships are not incidental to the human person. Relationships are not what we just happen to be living in. Relationships are what we were created to live in, to coexist 
with others to pursue our common good. So relationships like dignity are what we are as human beings and no one else and nothing else in heaven and on the earth is so constituted. And so as creatures created with an inalienable dignity, we exist in relationship with our brothers and sisters and outside of this relationship, less than human is what we tend to become. This characteristic of the human person prepares us to recognize and to live with the principle of solidarity, committing to the well-being of the neighbor or the other person. And with solidarity will come the other principle of subsidiarity, lending where it is necessary to lend support to the other person to do best what he or she alone can do. Subsidium, you render help to another person to do just what he or she can do. This is a principle which we are encouraged to promote very, 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 very broadly. And it is a principle that recognizes the protagonism of poor people. The principle that, uh, that, that uh, you know, says, uh, uh, would urges us to consider poor people or people with vulnerabilities that they are protagonists of their own development, that they need to be helped to be the agents of their own development, that it's not something that has to be done for them, but they need to be empowered to exercise, as it were, all the, all the, all the, all the passages towards, uh, towards their own pro, uh, development, and that happens through subsidiarity. So if solidarity means we care for the other one, subsidiarity means your care for the other one should not take over, but must rather recognize the creativity and the competence of the other one to that he can be made the protagonist or the agent of his own creation, uh, of his own uh, development and care. So these are some basic anthropological features or characterizations of the human person in scriptures, and uh, inspired by the Christian sense and understanding of the human person. We call the Christian anthropology or the sense of the human person as a relational being. It is with this understanding of the human person and her development that the social doctrine of the church teaches that the true and authentic development of the human person must be integral and truly human. And it began with the popes of the Second Vatican Council. So if this analysis and talk about the human nature, its dignity and growth of all of that, enables us to gain, a, if you want, a, a healthier perception of the human person, his nature, and how it's so necessary to, be draw, to draw it out of poverty and uh, all, the, all the negative situations in life because they're not consonant with its dignity, all of these reflections and conclusions feed into what the church now has formulated as the principle of integral human development. So this becomes the third part, act. How does the church act in this case? How the church acts in this case is that inspired by this anthropological analysis of the human person and the understanding of the human person as a relational, relational unity, the church gathers all of this and formulates it together in the principles of the integral human development. And not only formulated the principles, but has now entrusted this principle to our dicastery and has made us the agents and implementation of these principles. So that is the way the church is acting, as it were, to restore and to save people, for, to bring people out of poverty and vulnerabilities and all of these. The inspiration of the anthropology leads to certain principles which are put together in the formulation of integral human de development and it is made a task of an office in the Vatican to promote this integral human development and that is our mandate. So this is the way the church is responding concretely to the presence of the issue of poor ones and vulnerable ones in our midst. And the formulation of this principle of integral human development began from the Second Vatican Council. Some uh, writer go back, yeah, it's all, it's all Pope John the 23rd, Second Vatican Pastor of Parchamentas, and then came to uh, his big in Sacred Matter Magistrate, and then, you know, goes on. So 
If, I, if I'm going on uh, now, it will be to trace how the different popes developed, developed this concept of integral human development uh, to the present form that it directs the work of our office. I will, I will, I will, I will skip, uh, I will jump through this because if we were going to go in detail from Pope John the 23rd to Pope Francis, that might be another lecture in itself. So, uh, so we'll skip that. In any case, so it all began at the Second Vatican Council. In the light of the alternative models of development, which appeared in the, in the 1960s and the 1970s, some of which were inspired by sometimes anti-capitalist human rights, green or cultural movements, the church also sketched, the church also formulated the basis for an alternative development model based on its Christian view of the human person and its social traditions starting from the Second Vatican Council, the Pope which began it and the Pope who concluded it. So John the 23rd started all this and he came with the idea of integral human development first saying that people responsible for public authority must have a valid conception of the common good. That's how we begin. People responsible for public authority must have a valid conception of the common good to promote and implement the sum of those conditions which permit and foster the human being's growth and development. So that's how John the 23rd started the talk about integral human development. So as he went on, Christian education, therefore, must be integral. That is, it must extend to each series of duties, and therefore, it must also engender and strengthen in the faithful a sense of carrying out the duties with social, economic, political character in the way of a Christian. The Vatican Council followed this and took it up in their document called the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes. And there it also says that the concept of integral human uh, person repeated in the document formulates and speaks about integral vocation of the human person. The human person has what it is called to achieve, which is not just economic and which is not just political. It is cultural, it is social, it is spiritual and religious. So as a vocation which corresponds to God's will for each person. Therefore, the human culture must be subordinated to the integral development of the human person, to the good of the community and of the whole of the humankind. From this, Pope Paul VI, who referred to himself before the United Nations as the Pope of the poor, took over from John in the 60s. The Vatican Council ended in 65. One thing that is interesting is that right after that, Pope John, Pope Paul VI uh, formulated the thing about Paul VI, Populorum Progressio, the development of people. The setting of that is very interesting, analyzed in so very many different ways. But from my part of the world, several countries of colonial lands got independence in the 60s. Several countries in Africa became independent in the 60s. Several countries in Asia became independent in the 60s. So the 60s were the era of independent, emerging new states. So Pope, Frank, Pope, uh, Pope, uh, Pope uh, Paul VI's concern about the development of people coincided with this, ex with this experience okay, in the world. As new states were emerging, how were we going to ensure or safeguard their development and growth. And that became the inspiration of Poplarum Progress or the development of people and the principles that it enunciated or mentioned inside there. And so for Pope John, Christian, uh, for Pope uh, Paul the, uh, VI, development then must be integral. It must be authentic. And for any development to be authentic, it must be integral, must cover every dimension of the human person. You would know that, for example, for a long time, the concept of development was dominated by the GDP, 
till scholars like Amartya Sen started widening the concept and the reference of development into access to education, access to healthcare, access to communication, and all of the widening the sense of uh, education development from uh, the GDP to other things. The popes were in that direction. And after Pope Paul VI, Pope John Paul II took over. And he talked about the need for a nuanced concept of development. And he said that the true and integral development of individuals and people must be one which concerns every part of their human nature. True conceptions of the world development of mankind exist, but both of them are imperfect unless they cover every aspect of the human person. Then he goes on and then publishes Solicitude Re Socialis and develops still this further. After Paul the Sixth came Pope Benedict XVI, who took up Poplorum Progressio and did his own commentary, as it were, in Caritas in Veritate, it's all big thing about rereading Poplorum Progressio and developing the sense of development. It is Pope Benedict who says that development is a vocation. It's a vocation of every person. That every person needs to recognize that he or she is called by God to flourish. And that it's up to, all, to, to the human person to be helped to flourish. And that this flourishing corresponds also to the transcendent nature of the human person, created body and soul and spirit. And therefore, we'd say the agent, true agents of development are those who know how to lift up their hands before God in prayer. So, Pope, Pope Benedict adds all of these dimensions then to development, inviting us to look at it as something that is personal, but something that's also open to the transcendent, something that also involves the grace and the assistance of God. Till this day, this last day of Pope Francis. For Pope Francis then, his then we all know in Lauda to see there's a lot of talk about this. Each human experience calls for another human experience, and its most uh, powerful expression is that everything is interconnected and interdependent. This expression of Pope Francis is the thing that has brought you know, a lot of change. The recognition that everything is interdependent and everything is interconnected. And this is not true only about biodiversity in the natural world, but it's also true about human relations and the human Human, human, human life. So then the interconnectedness of, of, uh, of everything in the, in the life of the world and in the life of, the human, uh, of human beings are what invite all of us to the principle of solidarity and the pursuit of the common good. Recognizing that the good things of the earth are things destined for all of us. So for Pope Francis then, uh, Human, integral human development is not about being or becoming. It is rather, it is rather, uh, uh, it, the integral human development is about being and becoming and not having. So it's not in terms of possession, but in terms of what we become, the flourishing that is destined for all of us. So, Pope Francis says that this sense of development then is a wisdom with which we must inspire every other thing that comes our way. And this is the wisdom with which he created our dicastery. So on the 17th of August, 2016, Pope Francis decided to reform some of the offices of the Roman Curia, the departments which work with him. And in the beginning paragraph, he says that the successor of St. Peter constantly reformed the structures which work with him so that he can better carry on his mandate. So that justifies his reform. The success of Peter constantly is called to reform the structures which work with him so that he can carry on his mandate. So from the 17th of August, we do have an office in the Vatican called a Dicasse for Integral Human Development. The mandate of, of this office is to promote the integral development of people, people all around the world, people of all kinds and all. And so some of the things I said uh, earlier on become, as it were, the charges or the mandate that we have. And I just 
go briefly to a few of the things that how we pursue this and, and then uh, leave, uh, leave mix a little bit of space for questions and answers that we may have. Recognizing that poverty, uh, people living in poverty sometimes, uh, 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 the effect of systemic evils and systemic whatever, one of the things we're doing in our office is engaging all the different sectors in society which have power and which exercise influence and which determine things. So we have met CEO of mining companies three times. We're engaging with them and we're talking with them so that the conflictual situation where they do operations will begin to reduce. So that understanding some of the principles of the church's social teaching, they can begin to modify to improve upon the situation of the places where they work. So it can become better, so condition can become a little bit improved. We've now met them. We've also met CEO of oil companies, ExxonMobil, Shell, and all, all of this, uh, uh, basically for the same thing. When we met them, the objective was in terms of climate change, carbon production, global warming, and to see again, to see whether we cannot think about an energy transition, moving away from the present dependence on fossil fuel to a new forms of fuel that will be less detrimental to mother nature, to creation, and all. We're talking with them. We're talking also with bankers, encouraging them to do ethical banking and to do especially what we are presenting to several people around the world, several local bishops, are social impact investment. Okay, this is a type of a business model. Some of you, there are economists among you, so you know what, what it is that we're talking about. So, when we are encouraging people to get into ethical banking a little bit, the social impact investment is a thing that we're offering to local bishops in places so that it gives them access to capital for their own business. It means that they have to do, there has to be a little bit of disruption. The disruption that must take place is, means that they no more dependent on grants and donations. Uh, but the possibility of, of, uh, of negotiating for uh, you know, a sum of money to do a decent pastoral project, probably without interest, or very reduced interest in, in, in the light of the benefits that the project would, uh, you know, would realize for the community. That's something that we're working on. So one of the things we're doing is engaging with sectors of society who do have influence on the lives of people in the hope that improving and establishing dialogue with them, we can also facilitate the improvement of the lives uh, of those who depend on these. The last group to visit with us was the leaders of fast food chains in Holland. So leaders of fast food chain in Holland come to our office and they come and they say, we've heard what Pope Francis is saying and want to see how we can contribute uh, to, to implementing some of the things that he's saying. So we say, fine, first thing you want to do, look down your supply chain and where you find slave labor, forced labor, or anything like that, correct that. And that would already be a big uh, improvement upon what you do. So these are, these are the gentle ways that we try to approach our term. So for us, it is not simply rhetoric, going around giving lectures about integral human development, but it's also finding out concretely how we can promote integral human development and growth. And our biggest partners in this are local Episcopal conferences. The bishops of local churches are our number one partners and ally. They are the ones who are with the people. We stuck out there in the Vatican. But these are the ones who live with the people. So we encourage them to formulate the development projects. We bring them to experts, fine tune them so they can be presented to groups that do impact investing for financing and things like that. So that's how gradually we are trying to deal with the issue of poverty and vulnerability in our midst by some of some, just some gestures. But this now is our mandate in the Vatican. And I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. I bored you enough. <laughs> Is 
Eminence has graciously agreed to receive questions for a few minutes. So if you have a question, um, please proceed to the microphones stationed on either side of the auditorium, and I'll acknowledge you. Um, I know that it will be tempting to ask the cardinal questions about all sorts of things, but out of respect for your fellow audience members, I ask that you please try to keep your questions to the point of tonight's lecture, uh, that you ask only one question, no follow-ups, please, and after you've asked your question, that you yield the microphone to the next person. Lisa, can we bring the house lights uh, uh, up just a little bit so that I can see the, the microphones better? Thank you. Your eminence. Please. Yes. Uh, is this working? Yes. Yes. Thank you for your inspiring talk. Uh, I think we should all get uh, some class credit or maybe a degree. <laughs> it was comprehensive. Um, my question is related to the fact that the talk is given uh, at a place of a university or two universities. And the Observe uh, Judge Act uh, that you mentioned is, is uh, understood well. I think for the universities, it's the easiest to look at observe and judge, it may be harder to look at act. And I, I'm wondering if from your perspective, the World Church perspective, any suggestions or coaching you would have for universities in terms of how they can uh, increase their participation and involvement in what you're suggesting? Gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the, you, the university. So, is is it true that you have difficulty about acting? I I was in Boston College. Just after a lot that to see was published, Father Father Meehan or Michael. In any case, so it was, it was a discussion. They had invited the climate scientists of the Obama government. Uh, you know, to engage a discussion. And the issue was where Pope Francis overstated the issue about, you know, climate, whatever, and where he understated uh, uh, the, 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 the stuff inside there. So that was the discussion. Right after that, we were introduced to a project of the students of Boston College of, you know, having decided themselves to to uh, 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 respond ecologically to the environment of their university, planting trees and ensuring certain good work. So this was an action of the university, okay, that they could at least help improve upon the, the tree planting or the, the, the tree, the vegetation of, of the campus. And that's, 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 that's what they did. Then I came to Ohio State. Ohio State, uh, uh, you know, had also, also organized an event on, uh, on ecology. And before the lecture, I was treated by the science students to electric car display. So uh, they brought electric cars, which they had designed, uses no fossil fuel. And that was my day. So uh, the first, you know, the tour of the university grounds in the air, model of electric cars. And they told me that there were four students, so for, uh, three guys and one, one uh, lady. All of them, they told me, already have companies waiting for them to graduate. So they, they, their jobs already cut out for them. But they, in their own way, were also responding to some of the challenges of, uh, of this. The last example I want to give up because I don't want to make it long for others who want to ask questions. It's, a, it's an initiative that you may have heard of called the Louder to See Challenge. The Louder to See Challenge was born out of a conference we organized in the Vatican about the encyclical, where certain participants, again from the United States, from university, decided to invite students to identify some of the challenges in the encyclical and to propose solutions. And they picked nine of the solutions proposed and they put them through, what do you call them? Accelerator, incubator, whatever you do to business people uh, to, to make them whatever. So they put them through this. And at the end of that, last December, 5th of December, in the Vatican, there was a presentation of these nine projects 
which they were going to fund into business. One about purifying water. Somebody had developed, uh, developed water filters that you can stick into any type of water and drink pure pot portable purified water. Somebody had also devised solar lamps, okay, that you can hang and, you know, you can whatever. Somebody has also from, from, from uh, Mexico, Guadalajara, two ladies have a, have a, I don't know whether this is known, probably known. If you have a brewery, they say that the, 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 the leftovers, the hops and the malt after the brewery, is supposed to be very rich in protein. So they have created flour from these, and where they were bagging them as a source of rich protein, bread, uh, sold and especially for poor countries, South Sudan and all of that, where there's malnourishment, there's something that they do. And so, and so on. Somebody's thing was about dealing with an industrial sludge, okay, from industry, how to purify that and all. So these are initiated by university students. So, so the thing about responding to some of these things, it's not, it's not beyond their reach. It, it, it's something that I think they can do. And again, as I said, gentlemen of the gentlemen, jury, ladies of the jury, you hear, you can respond. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, the response to the question. Please. Uh, pick it up, it's a little low for me. During your talk, you mentioned Amartya Sen. I'm interested in, in which ways do you think his capability approach differs from the Catholic understanding of integral human development, and how, as Catholics, we can use these approaches to influence a predominantly utilitarian global economic structure? Okay, thanks. Uh, we started talking about Hamartia Sam. Actually, you can connect him also with Hababu Ruhak, uh, the Pakistani other guy. So these two, these two economists, uh, economists have been talking about the fact that the, 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 the reference to development is not simply the GDP, but, but you can consider them in terms of services available to people and services which can help people develop and grow. So the access to education, access to communication, access to health care, access to decent labor and all of those. Those are the presenting the developer in terms of access to services like that is what uh, you know, we pick up as something that, we, you know, that relates to what we're talking about. If integral human development is not just about you know, economic output and productivity and growth, but about you know, this other broader, the broader reference are what we want to encourage. So, in our office, then there's no, there's no problem. Just that we recognize that Amartya Sen is Amartya Sen, Habakkuk is that, and that they do not share the same sense of, you know, uh, let's say, theological anthropology, the same sense of the, of the human person with us, okay, for us to recognize, you know, uh, that the fallen nature of money they need forever. That we do not expect them to, uh, you know, adapt, but we, in conversation, we we'll talk about with about all, all of that, but what we encourage in their research and all of that is the way that they have amplified the vision of development and broadened it to include all of these other services. So before we conclude tonight, um, is this on? There we go. Um, I have just two quick announcements. First, I'm very pleased to announce that next year's McMahon Aquinas Lecture will be, will be delivered by Professor John O'Callaghan Dr. O'Callaghan is the director of the Maritan Center at the University of Notre Dame. He's a past president of the American Catholic Philosophical Association and a lifetime member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas. I hope you'll be able to join us next year for his lecture. Second, our friends from Sodexo have prepared a very nice reception in the lobby and you're all cordially invited to join us for refreshments and conversation. And then finally, on behalf of St. Mary's College, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight and ask that you join me in thanking Cardinal Turkson one more time for his talk. Thank you.